heart pieces of what we do is our curriculum that we use with our kids. And so um, you can come on in if you want and get snacks. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to Stacy Stevens. Stacy is our curriculum coordinator, our curriculum director, and um, you will be, um, she's something that you'll hear about not only today from today, but we'll be having another meeting um, about Santa Cruz Radio recording in early May, and um, the curriculum office has been instrumental to the middle school in our work and our work together. And so I just want to say um, thank you, Stacy, for helping put together this presentation for all of us today. Thank you. And I'm really excited when I'm asked to do things like this. Really, I get to go talk to people about curriculum. And then come before, like, that's so exciting. Um, so first off, I mean, to echo Beth, thank you so much for coming and for your interest and for total transparency. We are a Common Core school. We adopted it because we liked it. And we're going to tell you a little bit about why we like it and what it's doing for us today. And um, because we actually have been Common Core for quite a while, for quite a while now. We're going to talk about a lot of the issues around the Common Core. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about curriculum. Um, really quickly, this is actually my last year at AES. I've been working here for six years. I actually came in as a middle school humanities teacher and worked with Beth um, and Barb for many years. And then the past three years, I've been full time in the curriculum office. But I am moving on to um, the International School of Beijing. And I will be oh so capably replaced by my uh, curriculum coordinator, middle school high school curriculum coordinator, Jessica Kruger who has been in the school for a few years and has been very much instrumental in a lot of the work that we've been doing um, the past year. So we pass in the time. Um, and I'll be doing this for other parents. So I want to talk a little bit about curriculum at AES because when you talk about the Common Core, that's actually just a really small piece of what we do and, and how we define our programs because the Common Core is really targeted at really only two subject areas. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of you know, this curriculum work that we do. And when you think about curriculum, you think about if I walk into a new classroom as a teacher, the thing I'm going to ask is, what am I doing? What am I teaching? And that's really at the heart of the curriculum. And then me, as a professional who's had a lot of experience teaching, I look at, well, what do my kids need to know? What do they need to understand? What do they need to do? And then that's how I plan my classes and I put together that educational experience that your children receive. So the curriculum is really the heart of it. It's really the kind of the architecture of what we do, and then we put a lot on, on top of it. So one of the things that we do here that's really important, it's important anywhere. I think it's actually almost more important in an international school because of the level of change and turnover that we have. I know that for the year that I came into the humanities department, which was six years ago, there's only one person still working in that department that I came in with. So in five years, our humanities department has has a whole new look. Actually, I was sitting in a meeting today, and I turned to Catherine Brown, I was like, oh my god, they're so young. Like, when did they get so old? <laughs> um, um, we weren't this young when we started. She goes, no, we weren't this young when we started. You know, so it does, we go through a lot of change in our schools, and so a lot of international schools have a curriculum review process, and we're no different. In that. And our curriculum review cycle is a five year cycle. It has various elements in every year. A big part of my job is working with vertical curriculum teams with an ES person, an MS person, an HS person to kind of facilitate this regular review of our curriculum. We always start off our curriculum reviews with what do we believe, what do we value, what's important to us about a world language. What's important to us about balanced literacy in an English program? So I always really start from the philosophy, the values piece, always going back to who are we as an institution, AES, what are our values and our missions, and connecting our different subject area philosophies to that. Then we go through a process of looking at standards. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about standards a little bit later. Um, but we look at standards because that's what really guides how we put our curriculum together. We talk about assessments. We do a lot of reflection. In fact, today we just ran a reflection protocol in with middle school humanities on the Common Core. And we've been implementing it for the past few years. We just did one in math in the middle school. We'll be doing one in math in the high school. And this is all a regular part of what we do for curriculum review. 
So they were always stopping and reflecting. And as I said, you know, really, it has a lot of reasons that we do this. One, because of our level of transition, we really we have to ensure a stable curriculum. We don't, I don't want to come back in five years and this school not look the same as it does today. You know, we want to make sure that we're, we're delivering a quality educational program that is stable and doesn't radically change from year to year. And with the level of turnover we have, it's the curriculum and the curriculum review that helps us do that. You know, we really want to take the time to think about what, what are the decisions that we've made, how are they going, what do we need to think about, what do we need to change, what do we need to consider moving forward and doing. And because of this level of change, this is also the process by which we kind of bring new teachers in. Because when you move from school to school, not all schools will have the same curriculum guides or the curriculum standards, those, those change. And so it's the curriculum review process, this vertical piece, that helps us orient our new faculty to what do we believe, what are our values, and help them understand like what is teaching at AES, what does that look like? And then we use it to really look forward. What, what are our next steps? What do we need to be thinking about? So to dive right in a little bit, so into the common core, which is I think, you know, probably why a lot of you are here is actually that topic. Um, in particular, is the Common Core. Um, we've actually been a Common Core school now. We're in our third year of implementation of the Common Core. The Common Core state standards came out in fairly late in 2009, and we began adopting them in 2011. I would say we were fairly early adopters of the Common Core for, for one reason, and one reason only, and that was our curriculum review cycle. We don't do every year in the same, we don't have every year the subject, all subjects in the same year. Not everyone is in year one at the same time. So it might be science is in year five, and world language is in year three, and English language arts is in year one. At the time the Common Core came out, we had just completed a math review, and we're starting an English language arts review. Knowing that we wouldn't have five years we wouldn't have, for, it would be five more years so we could look at the Common Core again. We kind of took a pause on the map and we said, okay, we need to stop and we need to consider this. And then we just started our normal process with English. So we're actually a little bit, I don't think in our region we're that far ahead, but we, we were pretty early adopters on this just because of where it fell in our curriculum review cycle. Um, one, there were some real positives to us being early. I think we're seeing the positives in that we've been living this for a long time now. We've had a lot of time to come to understand what does the common core mean, what are the implications for practice, how do we best meet the needs of students in attaining these standards. But one of the negatives that we found was we did a lot on our own. The amount of work that our teachers have done, not just in middle school, I know this is a middle school presentation, but I have to speak for the elementary school and the high school as well. The amount of work the teachers have done has been an enormous amount of work. You know, when you're in when you're in the states, you have a Department of Education behind you coordinating and facilitating hundreds, if not thousands, of school students' work. So a lot of times in international schools, we are in these little systems unto ourselves, but we're small systems. And so when we take on something like the Common Core, we don't have a Department of Education. Supporting us, and so that's really where the teachers, you know, we have to dig in. I mean, the curriculum office supports them, but we're just we do it, we do all the same work with much smaller numbers, which has its its pluses and minuses as well, because of, because of the amount of work that we've had to do as individual teachers, people know the Common Core really well. No one was handed a document and said, "Oh, here now teach this." We really had to process it. We really had to break it down. We really had to learn it but it's been an enormous amount of time and effort, I think, you know, positively invested by our teachers, that we're seeing a lot of real gains and understanding about where we're at because of all of this time that we spent. So why did we choose the Common Core? And just to make it clear, when we're talking about the Common Core, again, <coughs> it's just really English language arts and math. Every subject area has standards. And every single one of our subject areas here at AES has selected, identified standards that are all based 
on standards from the United States. Okay? So when we're talking about the Common Core, we're just talking about two of what are ten subject areas here. What the Common Core has set off, however, in English and math, it has caused some even more revision to other major standards documents in the states. We are starting to get science standards. There are new social studies standards that have been done not necessarily by the same people who did the Common Core, but they have been done out of the same sort of effort and desire to have a little bit more coherent national standards and national guidelines, which is something that we don't have in the United States, which I will talk about a little bit later in terms of some of the things you hear about the Common Core in the media and where that comes from and what that is. So there are several reasons that we selected the Common Core here at AES, and probably one of the biggest ones is alignment. You know, standards documents, and the Common Core is a set of standards. Standards documents are what we're given as teachers. It's that piece that I said, oh, what am I doing? What am I teaching? What do my kids need to know? What do they need to understand? Well, if I walk into a new school, the first question I'm going to ask her, what are your standards? Where are my standards? That basically tells me what my job is as an instructor. One of the things that is one of the huge positives of the Common Core is a lot of our standards are called, I'm sorry to be curriculum speaking here, but I'm trying to translate what sort of what we deal with as professionals and why this is a, an improved processing document. For us, a lot of our standards are what we call banded. So what happens in a middle school is I walk in as a middle school teacher and I say, what are my standards, what's my job, and I'm handed a document that says, gives me a pile of statements, and it just has labeled on it 6-8. So it's three years of a program all lumped into one set of standards. What the Common Core has, and so as teachers we have to go, okay, well, Here's six to eight. We've got to figure out what's going on at six. We've got to figure out what's going on at seven. We've got to figure out what's going on at eight. And as much work as it's been to do the Common Core, it's even more work to sit down with a set a document that doesn't kind of divide it out at grade levels. So what the Common Core has done is it's articulated out the standards per grade level. We no longer get standards that are banned in K to two, three to five six to eight. They're still banded in the high school, but they're banded at 9, 10, and 11, 12. So what that does is by creating really clear targets at every grade level, we have much greater alignment than we've had before. You really have a spiraling curriculum that has been determined by people who research when is it best to learn this concept in math. When are kids developmentally most ready and most prepared for this concept or this idea? So they can apply all that research to say these are the ideas and things that are most appropriate for sixth grade. Well, and in fifth grade to be successful in sixth grade, we have to have done this. And so on and so on. From sixth grade, the next logical step is this. So it creates a lot more alignment for us as an institution so that we give a more comprehensive, and coherent education. There's, it's harder for things to fall through the cracks when you're not dividing everything out on your own and deciding this goes in this pile, this goes in this pile, this goes in this pile. Also, it's going to help when your kids go to other schools. If AES is sitting here with banded standards and benchmarks, deciding from six to eight, I've got this pile of standards. In grade six, we're doing this. In grade seven, we're doing this. In grade eight, we're doing this and you move on to Dubai, and Dubai has taken the same standards document that was banded, but they have put it together differently, there will be holes and gaps in your child's education. So as more and more schools adopt the Common Core, what happens is when you have a sixth grader at AES, and they go to Dubai, Dubai knows what they got in sixth grade, and they're gonna get the same standards in Dubai that they would have gotten in AES. This piece of alignment is really huge in this document for us within schools and I think has even larger implications for us as international schools and all of the different systems and places that we send them 
to around, around the world. It is research-based. Um, they basically started with universities. What is it that children need to be, or what is it the kids need to know and be able to do to be successful in university programs? And really where a lot of this comes from, a lot of these efforts come from is universities getting high school graduates who couldn't take freshman English, who couldn't take freshman math. But they were coming to them having passed state tests, having graduated from high school, having okay grades that would indicate that they should be more prepared and ready for the work than they were. So in using really backwards design and knowing that although most, some kids may not all go to university, that for most parents is ultimately the goal, whether they make it there or not, that's usually what most people want for their kids. And working backwards, what is it that we need to be doing with them through high school, through middle school, through elementary school, to make sure that we're paving the way for them to be college and career Right, it's not just college, it's also career. What are the skills that you need to be successful if you didn't go to university? So that's where it really started was with the research and the universities about what's developmentally appropriate, what is an appropriate spiraling curriculum, and what does that look like in how if you chart that out over 13 year education, what does that look like and where does it belong? And that's essentially really where the common core really was, it was born was between content area specialists, teachers, and professors and university researchers. It's also internationally benchmarked. Um, part of this was most school systems, I think probably many of you come from many different countries and not just the United States. And this is something that's a little bit quirky about the United States. Most countries have a nationally adopted curriculum. That no matter where you're going to school in France, 10th grade looks like this, in the north, in the center, in the south. That is not the case, or was not the case in the United States. And it has really to do with the Constitution and where we've given rights to various entities in the United States. Education is a state's right. It was up to states to determine what the education in their state looked like. So what this means is that from state to state, you can begin a radically different education based on where you were born in the United States. And this is very different than if you were born in France, we would know what the education was. If you were born in Australia, we would know what the education was. But we didn't know that in the United States. So a lot of this really started with international benchmarking. For states that had, or for countries that had what we perceived to be high standards, high expectations, high levels of rigor, what do their national standards look like? So looking at countries like Finland, looking at Singapore, who are some of the really high achievers on the PISA test? You often hear PISA referenced in a lot of this as part of the reason for international benchmarking and part of the sort of rationale between behind the Common Core for trying to have a more coherent system. And I want to say national standards, we avoid saying that, because it's really up to the states to adopt them, and some states have not. But really, it was looking at the PISA test, like who are some of the high-performing schools or step countries, and what do their standards look like? How is it they're progressing kids through them? One of the things that was also very typical about U.S. standards is we tend to call it um, a mile wide and an inch deep. Like there wasn't a lot of depth, but there was a lot of stuff. And some of the most high performing countries on the PISA exam, they don't have mile wide and inch deep. There's much more focus, much more about depth, much more about understanding, much more about transfer. So part of this effort was in trying to really create more focused teaching and directions for teachers so that there was more focused learning for students and understanding, deep understanding is more at the core of it rather than we're going to learn a lot, a little about a whole lot, okay? So there's, there's, that's also part of that spiral piece of trying to repeat and hit the same things over and over again. It's a lot more focused in 
coherence. And that goes to what I was just saying about having, having dropped some content, really, and kind of saying, like, what are the core ideas? What are the big ideas? And how do we cycle back and through these core ideas and these big ideas through the course of a child's educational career? It's a clear target. Targets every class builds on the next. So really, when you even take the document, which is available online, like anybody can look at it, um, when you take the document and you compare, like this is what it says for a second grader, this is what it says for a third grader, this is what it says for a fourth grader, you will notice that the language and the demands become increasingly rigorous, complex, higher expectations, because we're really scaffolding up those ideas and really trying to bump up the rigor at each grade level. I want to make a real quick comment here about just standards in the United States, because I think it's important from a historical context to kind of understand why is it that if this was a state's right and states developed their own standards, why did the U.S. encourage, why it's actually the National Governors Association, came together to try and create one set of standards for this. And part of this is the standards to us as a profession in education are actually relatively new. We as teachers didn't teach with standards. I mean, Jessica and, and Beth and I always had standards because we both start, we all started teaching in the 90s or the early 2000s. But standards really didn't start, the standards-based movement didn't start until the late 80s or the early 90s. So in some ways, we're on sometimes the second or third iteration of these documents, and over time, we've learned more. We've learned more about what works, about what a scaffolded curriculum looks like, what makes sense developmentally. So that's also a part, I think, that, you know, education is a real learning progression, or profession, and there's new research all the time. There's new understanding all the time about what kids can do, what they understand, what's developmentally appropriate. Just like in the medical profession, there's always new research, there's always new understanding, and there's always new things that you have to learn to keep your practice sharp. It has widely been adopted in the United States. Um, it was, as I said, an effort from the National Gover Governors Association to try and address some real issues educationally in the United States. One of them, first and foremost, being an issue of equity. Where you were born, in what state, and perhaps what city could really det det um, determine the education that you were going to receive and what you were going to learn. Some states have very, very high expectations. Some states have very, very low expectations. And as teachers, we are trained to teach the standards. If the standards are low, the children are probably being taught to lower standards. And so this was a real effort and part of the educational reform movement that's happening in the United States to improve the overall quality of education in the United States for a, a major reason, which is equity. Kids were simply not receiving equitable educations in the United States. We wanted to also really try and have more understanding of what kids were going to get when they went to university. So used universities knew more about what every child was getting an understanding because there was more unification around the standards. We do not call them national standards because it is up to every state to adopt them. And 46 states have adopted the Common Core. Only four states did not. I believe Minnesota adopted them in math and perhaps not English, or I might have it the other way around. But as it stands, 46 states have adopted the Common Core and are using it to redesign their curriculums in their school systems. One of the other huge benefits, and this really goes back to, I think, one of our big takeaways, one of our big pieces of learning, is because we were so early in this and we had to dig in so much on our own, one of the things we're definitely seeing and it's helping us with new teachers who are coming in who maybe haven't been teaching the Common Core somewhere else. The number of resources and things out there to help us do our jobs, the quality is unprecedented, the targets are so clear, and it's actually, as I talked about earlier, you know, kind of working like a small district and doing all of this work ourselves, it's really, we're really starting to benefit from all of the work that all of these states are doing. You have New York, who has engaged New York, which is a really great site that a lot of our teachers are using, that really helps you kind of understand the standards, gives sample assessments, 
sample uh, essential questions, gives different activities, gives different lesson plans. It's very, very detailed in terms of resources. So our teachers actually have so much more to choose from in terms of what can help me teach my class and meet the needs of my students in the best way I possibly can. And it's just having this one clear target. And we've never had that in the States. In the States, it was 50 states acting like 50 nations with 50 national curriculums. And now we basically have one major target in the United States, and it's changing everything. You might have seen about the SAT changing. Why is the SAT changing? It's changing because of the Common Core. Everything is orienting to the Common Core. The assessments, what's going to happen, the SAT tests are going to change. They're going to target the Common Core more. And I think, in fact, some schools, I think, will probably start to see an effect of not going to the Common Core when the ACT is testing to the Common Core, when the ACT is testing to the Common Core. Schools that haven't made this move, it'll be interesting to see what happens with their students' test scores. If they don't start preparing their kids for what colleges expect and 46 states have said they're doing for their students. It's going to have impl implications, I would say, in like three to four years on SAT test scores for some people. So it's just having this real clear target in all of these, uh, all of these resources that are much so much more helpful. And now the little schools like AES don't have to work in isolation. We don't have to just be dependent on the textbook that the school bought and put in my classroom. If I don't like what's in the textbook, I have resources from all kinds of places that I can go and I can find the needs of my students to help achieve the information. Or if I have something that's not working, I have lots of resources to go look for something that might work better. So it's giving us a lot of options. So I want to talk really quickly about some of the changes, what's different here um, in, the, in math in particular. And I, hopefully some of you have been to some of our Irma Anderson presentations. We've actually linked, at the end today, I'm going to show you a resource blog where we've linked a lot of presentations with some of the consultants that we've had to come in um, and work with us. Because this move for us is not something that we've taken lightly. The school has. Um, invested in our teachers and our understanding and trying to help us understand what it is we have to do and how we have to change to meet the Common Core. And so we've had a lot of help from people like Irma Anderson. We've had teachers, you know, involved in math cohorts that come back and help at grade levels and um, just to kind of help with this implementation. We have really tried to thoughtfully implement and really try and skill up our teachers and put some resources into skilling them up and helping them understand so that we're not making it up as we go along. So there are four or five major shifts in math, and it really is along the lines of some of the things that I said about what we liked about the Common Core. It's this focus. It's going deep on major concepts that are really the key concepts for getting kids to advanced algebra. You know, they say advanced algebra, algebra and advanced algebra, you know, are key classes. If you, don't, if you don't master those concepts, you will not be able to unlock concepts as you go farther up in terms of calculus and things like that. So there's a lot of focus on what are those key concepts. It's coherent. It expects kids to be fluent in mathematics like it's a language. That they have computational fluency, they have conceptual fluency, that there's not just one way of doing it. And this is one of the things you see on Facebook, oh, the new math, what is the common core? Done to the new math. Well, that's not Common Core. Common Core is following along research shifts that say that it's, you have to build conceptual understanding in students. Common Core is just basing what it does on the research. The research says students need conceptual fluency, they need conceptual understanding. And the Common Core, as a research based document, expects that as well.